relentless love he has for us. So let's sing out with all we have today. Lift your voice. Salvation sounds a new beginning. As distant hearts begin believing. Redemption's been is unrelenting. Your love goes on.
Your treasure in jars of 
into your wrists and into your feet that with every every pounding of that hammer with the pain and the cries that that came out of your mouth Lord you had us on your mind you had us you were thinking of us you were calling out our names and saying this is for you this is for you Give us a fresh glimpse of that reality again today, Lord. That the price you paid on Calvary's hill upon that cross would never become so familiar to us that we forget or lose the length, the breadth, the width, and the depth of your amazing and incredible love for each one of us. And Lord, we pray for those individuals that are here today that have never really had a revelation of your love that changed them forever. God, we ask that you would do a miracle in their hearts today. God, whoever that is, Lord, I know they're here. I know they're here, and even as I speak and pray, God, they know that this is for them, that you brought them in here today to give them a glimpse of your love for them. We pray that their hearts would be open to receive your love through salvation, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and remain in an attitude of worship and be seated. The ushers are gonna begin to distribute communion elements this morning. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've given your heart to him, I, and I, I don't know why, but I can't help but say this. If you're here and you haven't given your heart to him, you're missing out on life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no life apart from Jesus. And he brought you here today because he wants you to enter into life, real living, real love and joy and peace that can only come through him. But if you are already a believer in Jesus Christ, we encourage you to receive communion with us today. I'm gonna ask you to hold on to the elements and we're gonna receive them together as the body of Christ in just a few moments. It's very important as we take communion as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we come before him in humility, that we never allow this to become so familiar that we receive communion in a flippant way. This is truly a holy and sacred practice of the disciples of Jesus. So we wanna encourage you as we continue to worship, to, to worship and ask the Lord. The Bible tells us that a man ought to examine himself before receiving the cup and the bread. So examine your heart once again and ask the Lord to show you if there's anything in your life, anything in your heart that you need to bring before him to receive forgiveness and cleansing before receiving communion today. Let's continue to worship him.
let's receive the cup together. Praise you, Lord. All right, church, now open your heart and begin to worship him in ways you've never worshiped him before. He is so worthy. restore hope in this place today, that you would do miracles in this house today. Oh God, we, we believe that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that you're the same God today that did the miracles that we read about in the Bible. And so we ask, Lord, that you would come and reveal yourself to the people in this room today. Reveal yourself and your miracle working power to those who need a fresh touch from you. If you need a fresh touch from God, just lift your hand and say, that's me, God. I want that. I want that. You've got to ask him. Oh, we thank you for it, Lord. We're believing you, thank you. to do what only you can do. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, one more thing before we move on. Is there anybody here that you just... You just want God to just show up in your life and just do what only God can do. 
Well, the Bible says that we have not because we ask not. And there's something about this one accord thing that we see in the scripture. So I want us to all, every person, that that's your passion. I mean, you just want to see God move. I mean, come on, who's with me? We just want to see God move. Oh, not because we need a sign to believe in him, but because he said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm going to ask you guys to just say this with me. Just say, God, come down. Come down. Do what you want to in me, in my life, in my family, in my church, in my city, in my nation, and in this world. Come, Lord, come. Woo, give him praise. God, we're hungry for you. Praise God. All right, thank you so much. For worshiping with us. You know, something that came out of our fusion service last Wednesday was a reminder from the Holy Spirit that the Bible says that we enthrone him with our praises. In other words, we establish a throne for the King of Kings when we praise him with all of our hearts. And church, we've done that today. We have enthroned him with our praises. He's here. Let's believe him to do what only he can do. I want to encourage you to find someone you've never met today. Introduce yourself and tell them to expect a miracle. And then you can be seated. Welcome to Radiant Church. Whether you're joining us live or online, we're glad you're here. My name is Scott, and we want to take a minute to make you aware of some exciting changes in the works for Easter weekend here at Radiant. Easter is one of the biggest weekends of the year, not only for our church, but churches all around the world. It's one of the few weekends out of the year where people naturally think they should attend church, which provides an incredible opportunity for all of us to invite them to join us here at Radiant. We want to do everything possible to make space for our guests that weekend. So we're moving our service times around a bit and adding a couple services to our Colorado Springs campuses to allow as many people as possible the opportunity to experience the life-changing message of the resurrection. We'll be providing tools in the weeks ahead to make inviting someone as easy as copying and pasting a link on your Facebook wall or handing a card to someone you know at work, the gym, or in the checkout line at the store. So check your bulletin, social media, or our website for more details on times and locations. And let's all be praying about who God would want us to bring to church this Easter weekend. Can you believe we're talking about Easter already? Didn't we? We just had like Thanksgiving. <laughs> now it's time for Easter. But it's just in a few weeks, so please be praying about who to invite. You know you have some neighbors and coworkers perhaps that... Just if they had the invitation, they would say, yeah, I'm going to go back to church. It's been a while for me. So please pray about who you should invite. Hey, if this is your first time here, we're so glad you're here today. Welcome to, welcome to Radiant Church. We're really glad to have you. I met some friends who were traveling and they're staying at the Broadmoor and they just came to church to worship with us and that was really fun. If this is your first or second or third time here, if you'd fill out the card that's in the seat in front of you and turn that in in the offering at the end of the service, that would be so great. We'd just love to know that you're here. We'll pray for you by name. We'll, we're just, we'll just uh, give you any inf information that you might be requesting. We really would like to just welcome you because it's just great to worship with you. There's something, something powerful that happens when we worship together and we do communion together and we remember the Lord together. We can do that on our own, but there's something great that happens corporately. Also, this Wednesday is Ascent. We do this every single Wednesday here at the Central Campus, and this week is 201, and it is a great chance to hear from Pastor Todd and Pastor Kelly about the, the vision and the mission and the, the heart of the church. This will be specifically Connect, and we'd love to invite you to be part of that. It's 6.30 here in the Lodge. There's kids' ministry and youth ministry at the same time, and uh, we'd love to have you here. One last reminder is it's Daylight Savings Time next weekend, so spring forward. Remember that. 
or you'll, you'll be all discombobulated next Sunday. So spring forward next Saturday evening. So th- without further ado, I'm just going to invite Pastor Todd to come up to do his sermon. I'm just going to pray for him. Didn't he do an amazing job on the sermon last week on those really difficult passages? I think he did too. I think he did. Let's just pray. Lord, thank you so much. It's an honor and a blessing and a privilege to gather together. We're so grateful we don't have to figure out all this stuff on our own, but we get to do life together in community. God, I just pray blessings and anointing and clarity and understanding on Pastor Todd as he presents this message today. God, you gave it to him, and I just pray you'd help him to to adequately deliver it. And God, open our ears and our hearts to hear those things that you have for us to hear this day. We are yours, and we're grateful to gather together in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Morning. morning. Welcome again to Radiant Church. When I walked in here, you guys were rocking. Looked like you were having a great time this morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching online today. It's so good to have you join us. I heard a story about two priests who were standing alongside the road, and they had a big sign that said, the end is near. Turn around before it's too late. And they were going to show it to every motorist that went by. But the very first car that came by, the driver yelled out the window, you crazy religious nuts, leave the rest of us alone. And then they saw him turn the corner, and they hear the brakes screeching, and they hear a big splash. And one priest turns to the other and says, do you think we should change our sign to the bridges out? (laughs) Well, I thought of that because of what Peter's going to tell us today. We're in 1 Peter chapter 4. We're continuing our series of teachings on unstoppable, a verse-by-verse study of 1 Peter. And we're now in verse 7 of chapter 4, and we read, but the end of all things is at hand. Peter isn't trying to be dramatic. He's not trying to be reactionary when he says the end of all things is at hand. In fact, as you read through the New Testament, you can't help but notice that in the writings of not only Peter, but Paul and John, and even some of the sayings of Jesus, that the end is at hand, that the imminent return of Jesus Christ is real, that Jesus could be coming at any time. However, you need to understand what it means when it talks about the last days or the end of all things. Realizing that the last days began when Jesus Christ came the first time, and they're going to end when Jesus Christ comes again. So we are living in the last days right now. And in fact, many believe we are living in the last of the last days. So how do we react? How do we respond? Well, there's different ways that people respond when they see their serious issues going on in the world. Peter says in verse 7 that we're to respond this way. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. He said instead of getting caught up with end-time speculation and getting into an eschatological frenzy, we're to be, and it could be translated this way, alert, self-controlled, and aware. Because the end of all things are at hand, We're to be very sober in the way we handle life. If a person knew that they were going to get a sobriety test, and it could mean the end of a job or the end of a situation that they've enjoyed, and just before they go into the sobriety test, they decide to chug a pint of whiskey, they wouldn't be very wise. And essentially, Peter is saying the same thing. He's saying this is no time to be spiritually intoxicated, but it's a time to be sober in our spirit, 
and not drunk with the cares of this world and the lusts of the things of this world. We're to be serious, and we're to be watchful in prayer. And when we hear the end of all things, it tells us that followers of Jesus Christ are first and foremost to be prayerful. I find that interesting that it's Peter saying this. Because you remember when Peter was with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, can you not watch with me for an hour? And he said, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. And sure enough, Peter, James, and John were all watchful. They watched the inside of their eyelids as they slept. But that is not what Jesus was wanting them to do. And it's not what Peter is telling us to do. He is saying we're living in the end of all time, and we are to be more prayerful than we've ever been before. You see, there's different ways people react when they think about the end times, when they think about the things going on in the world. And it's very easy to look at the chaos in the world and the difficulties that many people are facing and to see the signs of the times and react in the wrong way. Some people react by going into, as I said, an eschatological frenzy. They get caught up with end times events and they become obsessed with end time prophecy. There's nothing wrong with biblical end time prophecy. It's good to study, but just don't be obsessed by it. There's other people that what they do is they decide, well, everything is going wrong. We're just going to hunker down, and I'm going to isolate my family and I from all of the things that are coming in the world. And Peter isn't suggesting that either. Neither is Peter telling us that we're to be people who are just saying, God, you are sovereign, you're in control, so we're just going to set back and we're going to try to endure anything that comes our way. That's not what Peter's saying either. He's saying we're to partner with God in what happens in his universe and in his world. We're to partner with God to see his end time purposes and plans fulfilled. And one of the greatest ways we can do that is in prayer. I know that some Christians have chosen not to really engage in prayer because they feel like God is sovereign and God will do what he'll do. And yes, God is sovereign, but that sovereign God has made a sovereign choice to use our prayers and to use our lives to fulfill his will. And so we have got to be more committed to prayer and more committed to obedience to God than we've ever been before when we realize we're living in this last day's age. And so Peter tells us in the midst of this that there are particularly four things that we're to do in addition to praying. We're to love by serving, we're to rejoice through trials, we're to glory in reproaches, and we're to commit ourselves to God in times of suffering. So let's look at each of those. First, we're to love by serving. He says in verse 8, and above all things. Now he said to be prayerful, but when he says above all things, he is saying this is the foundation of our prayers. This is the motivation of our prayers. In fact, this is the foundation of everything we do and what motivates everything that we accomplish. And what he's going to say that is, is love. Remember, Jesus said, we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're to be lovers, and love is to motivate our lives. He goes on to say, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. Now, this idea of fervent means to be stretched out, to be eager, to be intense. It is fully giving yourself away in love. And the imagery is that of an athlete who is straining for the victory. Now, an athlete who may be very talented and very gifted is never going to be world class unless he prepares, unless he practices, unless he really engages to develop his skills. And in the same way, Romans 5, 5 says the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. God's love is active. We have all the capability, but we have to learn the skills of love. We're going to have to give ourselves to love. We're going to have to choose to be loving people. And Peter says in the end of verse 8, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And as Peter often does, he's quoting the Old Testament here from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. And he's saying that love covers over without a cover-up. And I think a great example of this, a tremendous illustration, is in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, we find the story in Genesis 9 of Noah. And 
Maybe even Peter's thinking of that. Because remember, Peter has just talked about Noah. <clears throat> and Noah, when he stepped off the ark, the one righteous man in all the earth, he steps into a new world that is untainted by sin. And immediately he gets drunk. <laughs> and we don't know what all happened with that. But in his drunken stupor, maybe before he could get dressed to go to bed, he passed out. And he's laying in bed. And his son Ham comes in and sees him in his shame. And he goes out to the rest of the family and he broadcasts the shame of Noah. However, his two other sons, Shem and Japheth, take a blanket and they walk backwards into the tent so they don't see their father's shame and they cover him over. That's the idea. Sin is dangerous and sin is deadly. And sin must be confronted. And it even must be confronted in the church. In fact, it must especially be confronted in the church. However, it shouldn't be broadcast. And there is this incredible desire in so many people to broadcast the sins of others. I think it's real obvious to see humans' propensity for that when you just look at the gossip columns or the tabloid magazines or the television programs that are talking about what the celebrities have done and what they do. And they talk about all of their exploits. And we look at that and we say, well, they're horrible in the way they live. I'm so glad I don't live that way. Now, we're not untainted by that in the church. In fact, in some ways, I think the church has the same spirit. When a minister falls or a pastor does something immoral or does something illegal, it's amazing how quickly that is spread across the body of Christ. And the Bible says that's not what we're to do. Sin is to be confronted, but people are to be restored after they've sinned. The fallen are to be lifted up. Yes, there may be a time of probation. Yes, sin must be confronted. But it shouldn't be broadcast. We shouldn't delight in sharing other people's sin because love covers a multitude of sins. And so we look at verse 9. Peter goes on to say, Be hospitable to one another. That word hospitable comes from the meaning of the love of strangers. And in that day, they were even more familiar than we are. They were so caught up with their families. And that's good. But the thought of the family brought connotations of only the family. And we're only going to take care of our own family. And I think what Peter is saying is when you come into the body of Christ, we're all part of that family. So we have to enlarge our tent and we have to care for one another. And he says we're to be hospitable to one another. And what does that really mean? Well, when we talk about being hospitable, it was very significant in that day. Because in that day, there weren't as many inns or hotels to stay in as there is today. And so because of that, people would need places to stay. And even if there was an inn, poor Christians couldn't afford that particular place to stay. So they needed somewhere to stay. And there would be traveling teachers, traveling apostles who would need a place to stay. And Peter is saying, open up your homes. Be hospitable to one another. And I think we have to take that admonition today. You see, they would even open their homes to have church. Most of the churches in that day took place in homes. So they had to be extremely hospitable. And in the same way, at Radiant Church, we encourage you to open your home for Bible studies. To open your home for one of the Radiant small groups. And that's significant that we do that. We need to have that same spirit of hospitality today. It's one of the ways that we see discipleship happen at Radiant Church is when people are willing to open their homes and to share the Word of God and to share food with one another. That's why every summer we make a high priority to call it a summer of impact. And part of that is to be good neighbors. It's so easy to come home, open your garage door from inside of your car, slip into the garage and never get to know your neighbor. And we say that is not what God has called us to do. He's put us in neighborhoods, and he's put us in communities to reach the people in our community and in our area. And so God wants us to reach out to others. So we say in the summer, fire up the barbecue. Invite friends and neighbors over and get to know one another. In the church, we're to be hospitable. We are to spend some time in other people's homes. We are to invite others to join us for dinner or for lunch. We need to go out of our way to be family to one another and to be hospitable to one another. Now, there's another side to that, and I think we see that at the end of verse 9. It says, to do it without grumbling. 
<clears throat> which tells us something, that being hospitable is neither convenient nor is it easy, that it can be inconvenient and it can be difficult. So there's a tendency to want to grumble when you're being hospitable, and Peter is saying, no, love doesn't act that way. Love gives itself away to other people. Now, let me say that at the same time, as Christians, we aren't to take advantage of Christian hospitality because some people are known to do that. Uh, somebody is so gracious and kind and opens their homes, and then they get taken advantage of. My father used to have a saying he would say regularly. In fact, we would even have my mother and father stay at our home when we were living in Texas, and I'll never forget they didn't stay long. Within a few days, they'd be headed back to their home. And my dad would always make this statement, company and fish have a lot in common. After three days, they both start to stink. And so we have to consider the other end of hospitality. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter reminds us that spiritual gifts and the gifts God has given us are not for us, they're for others that he gives us the gift to share it. In fact, he calls it a stewardship. Being a steward means you're managed, managing the resources of someone else. God owns all things, and God is a distributor and giver of gifts. God does not give you gifts for your own benefit alone. He gives you gifts to share them with other people, and that is exactly what Peter is telling us here. Now, throughout the New Testament, there's a lot of explanation of gifts. I think particularly 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12, where it talks about motivational gifts and it talks about spiritual gifts. And at the same time, in this passage, he is dividing up gifts, but in a much simpler way. He's talking about vocal gifts or spoken gifts, and he's also talking about serving gifts. Look at verse 11. He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. When I think about gifts, in the context of what Peter is saying here, I think about the lights that we have in this room. You know, the lights are wonderful. We can see. They shine. However, to get the light, there has to be a conduit. You see, behind the scenes, what we can't see is a conduit that takes the electricity and runs it to the light fixture so that we can have light. And the light shines, and it gives illumination, and that's wonderful. However, we don't see the conduit. We don't focus on the conduit, and you and I are the conduit. God is the one with the power. People are touched by the light, but we're the conduit, and the conduit is behind the scenes. When gifts happen, when lives are touched, when lives are changed, it's not to draw attention to ourselves. It's not to make us look great or make us look wonderful. It's so that God is glorified. It's so that God receives the honor. You're nothing but conduit being used by God to deliver his light to the world. And we've got to remember that. Now, during the last days, Peter says that we're to love by serving and we are to, second of all, rejoice through trials. Look at verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Peter's saying, don't be surprised by trials. Don't be surprised by suffering. And listen, if you're surprised by trials and suffering that comes into your life, you're never going to be able to properly handle trials and suffering. You're going to say, why me? Because all of us have this tendency to know that trials and suffering happen to people, just not to us. So when other people go through hardship, we expect it. But when it happens to us, we say, why me, God? Why me? How could it be me? How could it happen to me? And Peter is saying, don't be surprised, especially when you're facing persecution and opposition. You see, Jesus repeatedly warned his disciples that they were going to face opposition and they were going to suffer persecution from the world. But in John 16, he said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And in an ultimate sense, Jesus Christ is going to deal with the world, the flesh, and the devil in an ultimate way. 
And even now, within our trials and challenges and suffering, God gives us the ability to overcome. But we will face trials. And here it's called a fiery trial. I love the symbol of fire. Fire is an amazing symbol throughout the Bible. Fire in the Bible speaks of holiness. It also speaks of the presence of God. In fact, the logo for Radiant Church is a flame. That's talking about God's presence being active among his people. It also speaks of judgment. But here it's not speaking of judgment as much as in the way that judgment speaks of purifying. God is purifying his people through trials. And we've got to understand that God is so economical. He'll use suffering and trials that come into our life that have come by the darkness, that have come in a fallen world, and he will use them to purify us, to transform us, to make us people we couldn't have been any other way. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now, what does fire do to gold? Well, when you put gold in the fire... Any alloys that are not pure gold are going to burn off. And all that's going to be left is the gold. And that's what happens with our faith. In fact, Peter already mentioned this over in 1 Peter 1.7. He said that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. Now, none of us want to hear about suffering and trials and persecution However, if we're going to study the Bible and see what God says about life and how we're to handle life, you're going to hear a lot about persecution, suffering, and trials. In fact, these people in that day were going through severe persecution that was only going to get worse in the years ahead. Right now, all over the world, there are Christians being persecuted for their faith, and they are going through some fiery trials, and the Bible says we're not to forget them. Don't you dare bury your head in the sand. Recognize there is severe persecution of Christians going on around the world today, and that persecution very likely is going to come our way in a hotter, more fiery way as it goes along, and we've got to recognize how to handle persecution and what to do with fiery trials. And it's not always the persecution of unbelievers or governments that come our way. There's just the general trials that come up in life. And God uses those trials and those difficulties to purify us. And what does the purification do? It lets us see the genuineness of our faith. Is our faith just emotion? Is it just because we're part of a group or a crowd who's all excited about God, and is that all that we have? Is it only emotion? Because when the fires come, you find out what's emotion and what's real. Something else it does that is so important is it reveals our allegiances. It shows us whether we're really committed to God or not. Or why we're committed to God. Because the wrong motives are burned up in the fire. Now the classic example of this is Job. You remember the story of Job? Job was a righteous man who was living upright in every part of his life. When one day in heaven, God is holding a council, and Satan is way at the back of the council, and God brings up Job. He says to Satan, as you've walked to and fro throughout the earth, have you considered my servant Job? Now, on reading the story of Job, I say, God, please never bring me up in heaven. (laughs) And Satan says, oh yeah, I've walked to and fro across the earth, and I've seen Job, and I'll tell you why he serves you. It's because you built a hedge around him. No problems, no difficulties come his way. He's prosperous and he's happy. He's fat and sassy. And of course, he's going to serve you and he's going to love you. Of course, who wouldn't? What was Satan saying? This is very important. He was saying, Job only loves you for what you do for him. He doesn't love you for who you are. You take away from him what you've given him and he won't serve you anymore. He'll curse you to your face. And so God says, all right. Let's find out. And so he lowers the hedge a bit, and Satan creeps in. And he brings devastation and destruction, unlike anything you can imagine to an individual life that wipes out everything that Job has. But instead of cursing God, he praises God, and he says that God has given and God has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, another day arises, 
where Satan is at the back of the room. And God says, now, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, yes, but skin for skin. You realize that you've just taken away material goods and family members, but you haven't dealt with him. You haven't touched his physical body. If you touch his physical body and cause harm and devastation to his life, then he's going to curse you. And God says, okay, let's see. Let's pull down the hedge a little bit further. And Satan comes in. And this time, he brings devastation to Job's body. There's boils all over his body. He's in miserable, horrible pain and sickness. And in the middle of it, his wife comes to him and says, Job, why don't you just give it up? Curse God and die. And there's a lesson in this. Along the way, when you're going through suffering and difficulty, so often the enemy of our soul will send people into our lives to only cause us to want to confirm God's lack of faithfulness and God's lack of loyalty, which really isn't true. But the emotions and the feelings are there when you're going through those times. How could God let this happen? Why would it happen? Is God faithful? Does God still love me? And someone will come along to confirm that in your life. And let me tell you, they may be well-meaning. They may even be empathetic, but they're a messenger of Satan. Do you remember that Peter fell into that same trap himself? When Jesus talked about his impending crucifixion, Peter said, may it never be, Lord. And Jesus swung around, looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Right then and there, Peter was being used by the powers of darkness to tempt Jesus from not doing what God, he knew, had called him to do. And in our lives, that's going to happen. You can't listen to those people. You cannot be distracted. You've got to remember and stand firm in the fact that God is faithful, God is good, and God is worthy of praise no matter what happens in my life. And so Job does just that. In fact, Job says that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And Satan is defeated. And once and for all, it is proven that God has people who will love him for being God and not simply for what God will do for them. However, in a much smaller way, all of us can fall into that same trap where we say things like, God, if you really loved me, you'd be doing this. Or God, if you would just do this in my life, then I'd really serve you. Or what good is it to serve God when things are not working out my way? You have fallen for the same trap that Job nearly fell into. In fact, when Job was going through it, he had a lot of questions for God. God, why this and why that? Why are the righteous suffering? And in the very end of the book, God comes to Job. Now, I love it. God says to Job, you've asked me a lot of questions. Now, it's my turn to ask you questions. And God says, hey, Job, do you know how I made a hippopotamus? What? Do you know how I created the Pleiades? And Job is dumbfounded. He doesn't know. Finally, he puts his hand over his mouth and says, I don't know anything. And God says, isn't that interesting? It only took, and and I am paraphrasing here, the intent of the book. But you hear this flow. He says, it only takes me six days to create the universe. It takes me a lifetime to deal with a human being. Creating the world is kindergarten stuff. Dealing with a human soul is Ph.D. material. And if you can't handle kindergarten, you'll never understand Ph.D. There are a lot of things about God and his dealings and his work that we're never going to understand in this life. But in the middle of things we don't understand, we can trust God, we can believe God, we can be assured if God before us, who can be against us? That he who did not spare his own son, how much more? Does he love you and care about your life? And neither height, nor depth, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, nor anything in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So don't believe the lies. Don't believe the circumstances. Trust God in the middle of the trial. And if you will, God will use that fiery trial to purify you and make you a far greater person than you could be any other way. And as we read through the New Testament, we see all kinds of illustrations of this truth. I think about John chapter 15, where Jesus says that I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then he talks about the vineyard keeper. And he talks about the vineyard keeper coming in and pruning the vine. 
Have you ever seen somebody, or have you ever, pruned a tree where you cut back all the dead branches? When that's going on, you think, that person is so mean. Look what he's doing to that tree. That is absolutely inhumane, or whatever it is. That is wrong to do that to agriculture. You shouldn't treat agriculture that way. I mean, don't you know these are living plants? But don't you realize that unless the pruning happens, the plant is never going to reach its full potential? It's never going to produce the fruit it's supposed to produce. You say, but I'm a fruitful Christian already. Then Jesus says, if you're really fruitful, I'm going to prune you even more so you can produce even more fruit. We need the pruning to be everything God has called us to be. Or I think about Hebrews chapter 12 where it talks about parents and children. And it says that children have to be disciplined by their parents. And some parents need to hear that. If you do not discipline your children, you are a lousy parent. We are to love our children, but we're also to discipline them. Now, I don't enjoy disciplining my children any more than they enjoy being disciplined. But I kind of, I'm always interested and fascinated when my wife disciplines my children. I I find it really fun to watch. I don't know why, there's a little perversity in me. But recently, recently my, my son Luke did something that needed to be disciplined. And Kelly brought the discipline. And I watched in the corner. And affirmed her in her disciplining. And my little boy started saying, you're a mean mom. You're a mean mom. You're a mean mom. And you know, God sometimes brings discipline in our lives. And we want to say, God, you're a mean God. God, how could you allow this? God, why didn't you come through for me like I wanted you to? Why didn't you do this? Why am I going through that? God, I don't understand this. God, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why am I experiencing this disciplining in my spirit? What's going on here? You're a mean God. It's very interesting. A few hours later, after Luke had gone through his discipline, had a time to think about it, I heard him talking to Kelly, and he said, Mom, you're the best mom in the world. Mom, I love you so much. Listen, there's coming a day, if you'll let God do that disciplining, you're going to look back and say, God, there's no God like you. You're the greatest God in the world. You're the only true God. God, I love you so much because we need discipline. We need pruning. And God will use the fiery trials that come into our life to allow us to experience not only his discipline and his pruning, but will allow us to become everything God has called us to be. Look at verse 13. It says, but rejoice to the extent Now, rejoice is really difficult. If you thought hospitality was a hard word, what about rejoice? When you're going through disciplining, and particularly when you're going through a fiery trial, and often it's a trial that you are in in a way that seems very unjust and very unfair, that you're to rejoice. Now, how can you rejoice? You're not a masochist. Nobody enjoys trials and suffering. Nobody enjoys hardship. Nobody wants it and desires it in their life. So how can you rejoice in the middle of it? He says rejoice to the extent, here's how, to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you also will be glad with exceeding joy. That is so good. You can rejoice when you're suffering knowing that Jesus suffered. You can rejoice when you're persecuted knowing that you're entering into the persecution and suffering of Jesus. And if Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. And if Jesus was persecuted, we're going to be persecuted. But in the end, there's always glory. There's always glory. C.S. Lewis was asked the question, why do the righteous suffer? And he said, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. And Peter is not speaking as a philosopher or simply as a teacher. He's speaking from experience. I think about Acts chapter 5, where, and we have talked about this when we were talking about submission, where Peter and the other apostles are standing before the Sanhedrin, and Peter is told he can't preach the gospel anymore. And Peter is very respectful to the Sanhedrin, but he says, We're going to have to serve God rather than man. We're going to have to obey God rather than man. And if you're saying we can't preach the gospel, Jesus already told us we have to preach the gospel, so we're not going to stop preaching the gospel. And because of that, they take the disciples and they beat them. 
And when I talk about disciplining children, even if you're someone who believes in corporal punishment, we're talking about not corporal punishment, we're talking about persecution. We're talking about brutality. We're talking about torture. These men were beaten to an inch of their life, and they leave that place. So Peter knows what it's like, and he also knows how to rejoice in the middle of persecution, because we read in Acts 541, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The early Christians saw it as a badge of honor to suffer for the name of Jesus. You see, suffering and glory always go together. God has the ability to transform our suffering into glory, which allows us to rejoice in the middle of suffering and persecution because we know God's at work in the middle of it, and he's going to do something far greater than anything we could ever imagine in the end. And then Peter goes on to tell us, in the last days, we also need to glory in reproaches. (laughs) Glory in reproaches? Come on. Rejoicing in persecution and suffering is bad enough, but to glory in reproaches? Verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. To me, that explains so much. Because I hear about martyrs who are burned at the stake for their faith, and yet they're rejoicing while they're being burned. And I say, how could that ever be? It's because the glory of God rests on them. You see, Peter has said there is a glory yet to come through our suffering. Because Jesus suffered, he entered into glory. And when we partake of Jesus' suffering, there's a day coming when we're going to enter into glory. There are the glories of heaven. But he's saying, even right now, we can experience glory. We can get a little taste of heaven when we're being persecuted. That God's grace is manifest in such power and glory that a person being burned at the stake can rejoice in the name of Jesus. That's why a prisoner for his faith in Christ can rejoice and not grumble and not complain, but endure it with courage and with absolute assurance that God is at work in his life because of God's grace and God's glory. And God's grace is always sufficient for whatever we're facing. One of the most powerful stories I've ever heard of this came from church history in a man named Michael Sadler. Michael Sadler was persecuted for his faith in a most severe way. In fact, his whole community was being persecuted. And he told those who were part of his group, he said, the day is coming when they're going to capture me. And he said, I want to give a witness for my faith. I want to let you know that God's grace is sufficient in the middle of any torture or persecution they put me through. He said, however, I think they're probably going to cut out my tongue. And so I won't be able to give a witness vocally. He said, if that happens, to show you that God's grace is sufficient in the middle of persecution, I'll put my two forefingers together. And certainly, what Sadler said happened. He was captured, they cut out his tongue, and they tied him to the back of a train of horses who drug him through the city. And without going into all the gory details, I'll say in the end, they put him on a torture device. It was a stake. But it wasn't a stake simply to be burned. It was a stake that had a machine attached to it that would raise it and lower it. Because when people were burned at the stake, they didn't die from the fire typically. They died from smoke inhalation. And they wanted Michael Sadler to face all of the torture and suffering that fire had to bring. And so they developed this device that would pull him in and out of the fire. They tie his hands with ropes to the stake. And there's a problem here. The other believers aren't going to know whether God's grace is sufficient. Not only can he not give a vocal testimony, he isn't able to put his forefingers together in case it is. So he's going in and out of the flames. And the followers of Jesus are looking on. But as he's going up and down, the ropes that tied his hands were burned off of his hands. And at the last minute before he dies, he reaches his two forefingers together and touches them, saying, God's grace is sufficient in the flame. You say, but pastor, I could never do that. And neither could I, in my strength or my ability. And neither could I do it with the grace that I have today. 
Because God's grace is always sufficient for what you're facing today. But let me tell you, if you can overcome temptation today, if you can trust God through the suffering and the persecution you're facing now, that day when the persecution becomes like that of Michael Sadler, you'd be able to trust God's grace because you'd find it sufficient in that day. God only gives us what we need at the time. But God's grace is always sufficient. He goes on to say in verse 14, on their part, that is those who are persecuting you, he is blasphemed. So they're trying to blaspheme God and they think they're able to accomplish that by persecuting you. But on your part, he's glorified. They think they're blaspheming, but really they're glorifying God through you. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Now, doesn't that list seem a bit unusual? He speaks of murderers, thieves, evildoers, busybodies. That word just doesn't fit. What is this saying? Well, I thought about it and and realized that murderers and thieves were people who were committing crimes that could be capital offenses. They could be killed for what they did. And in that day, the church of Jesus Christ that Peter is speaking to, were approaching days where they could be killed for their faith. But not because of any wrong they'd done, but because they were followers of Jesus. And then he mentions busybodies. Oh, what's that about? Well, the New American Standard Translation calls busybodies troublesome meddlers. Another translation I saw, I love it, said they are self-appointed interferers. (laughs) What are they? They're agitators. They come in and they agitate. They cause problems. They cause dissension. They cause strife. They, they come against everything and they cause all kinds of problems. And it's saying if you're acting like that, you are not being persecuted for righteousness sake. You're being persecuted for stupidity's sake. Don't think that you're being persecuted for your faith. You're being persecuted for your sin. And so make sure you're being persecuted for the right reason. Verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. That word Christian is very interesting. I know it's very common for us, but do you realize it's not common in the Bible? That's only the third time the word Christian is used in the entire Bible. The other two times are in the book of Acts. See, the word Christian actually was a derogatory term. In that day, everyone who was a Roman citizen was expected to give allegiance to Caesar. You had to say, Caesar is Lord. You actually were a worshiper of Caesar. You were a servant of Caesar. And because of that, you were called the Kaiser Antios. That was your name, the Kaiser Antios. However, when you were a follower of Jesus, you served Jesus, and you didn't say Caesar is Lord, you said Jesus is Lord. And so in a derogatory way, people called them the Christian Anios, the followers of Jesus, those devoted to Jesus, the slaves of Jesus. And what Peter is saying here, I think, is quite important, especially when you consider the life of Peter. He's saying, if you suffer for saying Jesus is Lord, don't be ashamed. It's a mark of honor. Now, notice There was a day when Peter was ashamed. Do you remember? Standing in the court of Caiaphas. Three times he denied he even knew the Lord. He knew what it was like to be a coward and to bow down and to back off your commitment to Christ. But we also know that Peter, over time, came to have such a solidity of commitment and such a determination to follow Jesus that at the end of his life, church history tells us they crucified him upside down. And in the middle of it, he refused to recant his faith in Jesus Christ. In the middle of the torture, he still declared, Jesus is Lord. Now, finally, in the last days, we are to commit in suffering. Commit ourselves during times of suffering. Look at verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God be? Now, what is this saying? It's saying that God always begins with his people. And if we're going through the judgment that purifies, what's going to happen to those who aren't followers of Christ? It begins with us, 
But if it's happening to us, the world is going to experience it in a far worse way. And it's not going to be the judgment of purification. It's going to be the judgment of the wrath of God. And then he says in verse 18, Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I believe that basically what Peter is saying here is if you're a follower of Jesus, this world is the worst hell you're ever going to know. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, this world is actually the most heaven you're ever going to know. Peter is giving us a very sober reminder that even though persecution and difficulty may face the Christian, that following Jesus is the only way to live and the only way to die. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. It's interesting. This is the only time in the New Testament that God is called a faithful creator. He's faithful. He's the one who created. He's the one who designed. He's the one who planned and sustains all things. And know that he is faithful to plan, design, and to uphold your life. You can be confident of that. And so it says when you're going through suffering, commit yourself to the faithful creator. And how do we know you're committing yourself to the faithful creator? Because you do good. Because you do good. You see, there is a tendency when you're going through suffering and hardship, particularly because of your faith, particularly because of faith-based persecution, there's a tendency to quit doing good. The book of Hebrews says not to be weary in well-doing, knowing that someday if you keep sowing, eventually you're going to reap. And when in the middle of persecution, hardship, and difficulty, instead of looking on yourself, instead of becoming introverted and only thinking of yourself, you continue to serve, continue to love, continue to give, continue to do good, continue to pray, continue to seek God, continue to follow hard after God. It is showing that you are a person who has committed yourself to the faithful creator. So he's challenging us in whatever we're going through to do good. Now, I don't know where this message hits you today, but I know that all of us can relate to some part of it. And I want to commend this congregation because this is not the kind of message that we usually like to hear. I know that some, all they want to hear is positive, affirming talk about how God always gives us victory and prosperity and health. And God does bless us. There's no doubt about it. But God also tells us how to deal with hardship and suffering and persecution. And if you don't understand that, when it comes into your life, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be surprised. And it's going to overtake you. But we've learned the truth from Peter. We've learned the secrets to enduring difficulty. But not only enduring difficulty and hardship and suffering and persecution, but to be able to overcome in the middle of it. Because we serve the one who has overcome the world. Let's pray together today. Father, I pray for every person here. And Lord, I ask you to do a wonderful work of grace and glory in every single life. Lord, I don't know where people are today. And their situation. But I know there's some people here that they're going through real suffering and real hardship. Maybe they feel betrayed today. Maybe they feel forsaken. Maybe they feel all alone. May the body of Christ come around them. And may we today encourage every person that we come in contact with that we have a faithful creator who's not going to let them down, who loves them, who will never leave them nor forsake them, no matter what their situation appears to be. And Father, I pray in the middle of suffering and persecution and hardship, we would love by serving. We would rejoice in the middle of trials, knowing that you're at work in them to fulfill something far greater than anything we could understand in this life. And that we would even glory in reproaches. That when maybe someone in the media speaks evil of us, or the press, or the culture around us tells us how awful Christians are and how wrong we are in what we believe, that we'll see it not as a dishonor, but we'll see it as an honor. We'll see it as being reproached for the cause of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would commit ourselves to God in times of suffering, that we would not quit doing good, 
And I pray for that one today that has gotten so introspective and focused on their own situation and their own difficulty that they have given up serving and giving and praying and doing those things that are good. Lord, I pray today that you would encourage them to continue in that. And Father, I thank you for every person here today. And we commit ourselves today to you, the faithful creator, and we say it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, today, I know there's some here that are away from God, or maybe you've never known him, but you can. And maybe today you want to pray a prayer of rededication or a prayer of commitment to Christ. Well, I want to lead you in that prayer. Let's have heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's all pray this together. Let's all talk to God. But pray something like this, and you could join me in and say, Dear God, I know I've sinned, but I believe Jesus died in my place. I declare that Jesus, you are Lord. God raised you from the dead, and you're my Lord. I ask you to wash away my sin. I ask you to come into my life and give me the power to follow you, and I'll follow you all of my life. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed something like that, God started a good work in your life, and we want to help you in your walk with God. And so, in front of you, you're going to find a card. It's a connection card. We'd ask you to fill that out if you're a newcomer and let us know if it's your first, second, or third time. We'd also like you to turn it over if you've made a commitment to Christ today and fill that out and say, I said yes to Jesus. And at the end of the service, buckets are going to be passed. You can drop the card in the bucket, or you can come up here at the end of the service and meet with one of our prayer teams, and they would not only pray with you, but they'd give you a gift to help you in your walk with God. Let's stand together today as we get ready to receive this morning's offering and to rejoice in God. Let me share with you uh, just a moment about one of the ministries here at Radiant Church that is so uh, effective and powerful in our community. It's called the Deaf Ministry, and it's more than just uh, signing Uh, for those who are deaf. A lot of churches have that, but what Radiant has is actually a ministry to deaf people that is quite extraordinary. It's one of the few in the country, to my knowledge. But James and Ramona Ramona Banks have faithfully been leading that ministry for years. On a regular basis, they have 30 to 50 people that they meet with every week right here in in a church community that's part of this church. But also, they minister to deaf people out in the community. And let me tell you, deaf people face unique and difficult circumstances and challenges. They've been, so many of them, taken advantage of by other people. They have deep hurts and wounds. And it's amazing to see how God gets a hold of their life, how they commit their lives to Christ, and how God brings a turnaround. Well, today, I want to remind you of that as we give, just to let you know that your giving is making a difference in ways you don't even realize. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I want to thank you that you're a part of what God is doing in his kingdom through Radiant Church and around the world. So let's get ready to receive this offering. And as we do, I want to pray not only for it and pray for you, but I want to pray for Pastor James and Ramona and their ministry in our community. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for James and Ramona. Thank you so much for James and some of the physical challenges he's faced in recent days. We ask that the Lord Jesus himself would bring healing to James's body restoration and recovery. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do a great work through that ministry. We pray, God, that you would uh, bring healing and wholeness to these people's lives, and you would even bring miraculous healing to their physical organ. Lord, we thank you, and we are praying and asking you to pour your spirit out upon our deaf ministry. We also thank you, Lord, for all of the wonderful people here at Radiant Church that are so faithful in their giving. I pray that as they give, Lord, that you would give back to them according to the law of reciprocity. As they sow, it's going to be given back to them so that they can give even more to extend your kingdom all around the world. And Father, we ask you for this, and we declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we receive this offering and close this service, let's give God praise. Let's give God glory. Let's make this offering part of our worship today. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrected.
your life, but specifically related to this sermon. Maybe you just are feeling like, I know about that suffering, and I need some, some prayer that I can find some joy in this. Please come on forward. These, these folks would love to linger with you and just pray and, and rejoice with you in the midst. If you have any other prayer requests, they're, they're happy to pray with you too. Otherwise, I just want to bless you. Say, may the Lord bless you and keep you this week. Go in, the, in, in faith, linger as long as you'd like to, but be blessed today. Resurrected King is resurrected me.